It's my great pleasure to introduce Lilia Giugni, who is our research associate. And I feel very privileged to have met Lilia because I realized when we met that I wasn't feminist enough. <laughs> That's right. So, <laughs> handing it over to you, Lilia. That's great phrasing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here with you all today. I know I've got a challenging spot. Everyone tends to feel sleepy after lunch. So I'm going to do my best to try and keep you all awake. And uh, I'm going to start doing exactly that by telling you a little bit about the background story of this new research project of mine, of ours, how it all started. It all started a few months ago when Paul, aka Professor Tracy, emailed me with the link to the Guardian article you can see behind me. Uh, asking whether I thought this could make for um, an interesting topic for a new research project. And as you can see, uh, the article sort of provocatively pointed out that feminism, uh, something uh, I personally and deeply care about, is used these days to sell pretty much anything, including breast implants. Which is something you can actually check out by yourselves, just by visiting the website of MYA, a UK-based plastic surgery company. Uh, so on their website, uh, they promote their services and they're actually quite uh, invasive procedures uh, by having uh, young women uh, from uh, very diverse ethnic uh, backgrounds saying things like, hi, I'm Sharifa, uh, I'm a feminist, and I got a book job. Because hey, you can have both. You can do both. <laughs> So my answer to Paul Seaman was, oh my god, yes. I think we should absolutely research this. Also because this is something that, uh, not only as a researcher, but as a, as a feminist activist, uh, I really kind of struggle with and ask myself uh, every day, this is something that is recurrent in the conversations that we have in women's rights and feminist spaces. The recurrent conversation and uh, uh, the, 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 the recurrent question being, how do we feel? about the fact that our movement, uh, our language, our symbols are being uh, incorporated for commercial purposes into marketing, into uh, advertising discourse. One could argue that there are some very, very positive sides to it. Obviously, this means that uh, our themes are becoming mainstream, that we are reaching out to, to a wider audience. However, isn't there a dark side to it as well? So many of us, obviously, especially in the social innovation and kind of social entrepreneurship sp uh, space, are more than ready and more than willing uh, to reward virtuous companies. So companies that try to incorporate gender equality practices into all sides of their work, including marketing. Uh, the real question being, do they? Do they walk the talk? Do they actually do, do they act as they preach? Plus, I feel there's also a kind of added layer of complexity, a further question to be asked, which is uh, leaving aside whether, whether companies walk the talk or not, isn't there a risk that uh, the message of a movement that is uh, very radical at its core uh, might end up being uh, diluted, trivialized, nullified, uh, eventually neutralized? So yeah. Paul and I decided that uh, we wanted to study exactly this, and we started brainstorming ideas about possible theoretical lenses, uh, possible methodologies, possible uh, concepts and case studies which could be relevant to what we wanted to study, to what we wanted to research. Uh, we knew that, uh, obviously, we wanted to build on institutional theory, which is uh, the scholarship, the, the literature space where we both uh, usually move, However, another thing that we quickly realized was that a relevant concept, a relevant uh, theory for us to build upon had to do with the idea of cultural appropriation. I'm sure this is a concept many of you are familiar with as a, uh, this, this kind of stemmed originally from uh, the field of post-colonial and critical race studies, but it has definitely entered the mainstream discourse. This is a uh, kind of buzzword that many of us use in our daily life. We felt that this concept was relevant uh, because we had the feeling that what was going on, what is going on here is uh, a mainstream dominant culture 
obviously dominant in the uh, neoliberal capitalistic system in which we all live, we're all enmeshed, co-opting, absorbing elements of another culture that started, at least at the beginning, as a minority counterculture. We also realized, uh, after a quick search through uh, kind of electronic archives of different ads, texts and posters and commercials and videos and so on, that gender washing, so this tendency to incorporate into uh, mainstream marketing discourse uh, uh, gender equality themes for opportunistic purposes was actually a practice as old as time. Uh, after a quick search, we were able to find examples of gender washing or femvertising, as it's now kind of fashionably called, uh, back from the 1920s. So we decided that the kind of question, the kind of puzzle uh, we wanted to, uh, to explore was as follows. What types of work do firms, um, uh, we decided to focus specifically on uh, US and uh, UK firms, for obvious reasons of time and space. So what types of work do these firms perform to appropriate feminist, broad, macrocultural discourses? And uh, with which outcomes, which impact, which reactions and backlashes potentially from the feminist side. So I'm gonna very quickly skim through our methodology. For the reasons I just explained, we decided to go for a, an in-depth historical study, reconstructing the ways in which this kind of appropriation work, as we call, performed by marketers and advertisers, has been changing through time starting from the 1920s to these days. What kind of similarities and differences we were able to spot between uh, the different practices whereby the disappropriation happens and uh, between the, the feminist backlashes of reactions. So that's uh, the data set on which we've been building, about 8,000 pages of uh, multimedia materials, think uh, advertising posters, and then uh, later on TV commercials, uh, ads from magazines, uh, YouTube videos, and so on, plus some ethnographic observations conducted on the internet. We also realized that um, a distinction, some of you will know a little bit more about the history of feminism and be familiar with, the distinction into uh, four waves of feminist activism was actually very relevant to uh, this research project. So uh, just to, to clarify, in case some of you wasn't familiar with this uh, uh, kind of timeline, normally women by first wave of feminism, uh, the kind of struggle uh, for women's rights to vote conducted by suffragettes and their allies, Obviously, we are talking about Anglo-American feminism. What's, what has been going on uh, in other countries, and especially in the global south, is very different, but that's what we're focusing on. The second wave being the revival of the movement, uh, starting from the 1960s and focusing on gender inequalities uh, at home and in the workplace, uh, with a special focus, a special attention towards uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Third wave, very fragmented, uh, heavily influenced by postmodernism, uh, but mostly celebrating the multiplicity of uh, women's experiences and feminine subjectivities. And finally, the fourth wave, what's going on today, uh, a movement to which I myself and I'm sure many people that I see here in this room feel kind of uh, as belonging to or associated with. Uh, so what marks the first wave is a very intense use of uh, uh, social media as mobilization tools, as well as two key principles. Intersectionality, so the idea that gender oppression intersects uh, constantly with other forms of discrimination and violence uh, based on uh, issues of race, class disabilities, uh, socioeconomic vulnerabilities, and so on and so forth. And finally, the concept of uh, everyday sexism. So the idea that far from uh, uh, gender equality having been already achieved, as uh, some people were kind of thinking or you know, bragging about in the 90s, actually women across the world still these days uh, struggle on a daily basis with different instances of microaggression and misogyny and discrimination. So uh, I'm not gonna go uh, very thoroughly through our dyna dynamic model and, uh, and findings, and this is, uh, by the way, still very much a work in progress, but the reason why I wanted to show to you uh, our uh, initial dynamic model is that I think it gives you an idea of the historical trajectory that we were able to trace back from the 1920s. So essentially, we realized that after each uh, feminist wave, uh, 
a set of actors, private sector actors, so we are talking uh, firms, marketers, as well as professional advertisers, have been performing a different set of appropriation work in order to co-opt, to incorporate, to mainstream feminist themes uh, uh, into their activities, obviously for commercial purposes. However, after each set of appropriation work, there has been a, a backlash from the feminist side. So this kind of given rise to what we call an appropriation resistance feedback loop. So I'm gonna use uh, the remainder of my time uh, to show to you guys a little bit our findings from uh, each of these different phases of appropriation. Let's start from phase number one, attempted appropriation. So what was happening there? Well, essentially, a number of uh, uh, Anglo-American firms and pioneers in the field of professional advertising have started to realize that uh, following massive changes in gender relations, so think uh, women's involvement in the war efforts, uh, as well as obviously the suffragettes uh, struggle for women's votes, have also led uh, to massive changes in consumption patterns. So in a nutshell, uh, they, had started, they had started targeting very uh, explicitly, very consciously, uh, women themselves as a very promising target audience. And they realized that an effective way to reach out to that target audience might have been to incorporate feminist language, feminist, single, uh, feminist symbols. So let me offer to you guys what I think is a very telling example from the tobacco industry. So this picture in black and white that you can see behind me uh, was taken in New York City in 1929 during the so-called Torches of Freedom March. So what happened there was that Edward Bernays, uh, at that time publicity guru, uh, it was also quite tellingly a nephew of Sigmund Freud and uh, a strong believer uh, in his uncle's theories about female desire and sexuality and so on and so forth. So he was working with American Tobacco and he knew that his clients were uh, targeting very heavily, very aggressively, the female markets, but that they had uh, to deal with the still very conservative sexual mores of the time. Uh, so at the time, decent women uh, weren't supposed to smoke, especially not outdoors. So what Bernice did was to recruit his own secretary and a bunch of other pretty, uh, attractive young girls and to have them marching, smoking publicly uh, during uh, the New York City uh, East End Parade, waving their lucky strikes, which he very promptly rebranded as torches of freedom, the symbols of female emancipation. And you can see how that discourse became uh, uh, recurrent in the cigarette ads of the time. You can see the lucky strikes there, you can see Philip Morris. Uh, so this appropriation of feminist aesthetics for once and rhetoric uh, for a second uh, uh, has meant that female empowerment uh, uh, was used uh, to sell, uh, to promote among women a practice that, uh, that was arguably uh, harmful for their own health. Interestingly, you can see that kind of attempted appropriation that we call selective borrowing uh, uh, insofar as at the time it was still a relatively, we, we, still, we, we saw still a relatively uh, limited number of actors engaging into that into the kind of work. Uh, so we can see how that selective borrowing practice uh, uh, became finding space uh, also in industries uh, other than the tobacco one. So you can see behind me, for example, this ad from TWA uh, so they were uh, advertising their airline uh, uh, through the images of female uh, uh, independent travelers and so on and so forth. Uh, the most important thing to be understood uh, when it comes to that phase though is that the vast majority of ads at that time were still heavily uh, sexist and patronizing. Um, so they were mainly uh, depicting women as pretty dolls or naive housewives. So that sort of insufficient appropriation led to uh, an open contestation, open opposition from within the feminist movement. And that's something that we see very heavily in the moment in which the second wave of feminism starts. Uh, so the 1960s is when we start seeing uh, uh, feminists, especially in the US, openly boycotting uh, sexist ads. 
It is when we see someone like Betty Friedan uh, with uh, volume, the feminine mystique is uh, mostly considered by historians of feminism as uh, uh, the manifesto of the second wave, taking issues very explicitly with uh, the ways in which the advertisement industry harmed women. She devoted many and many pages to advertisement as a sector uh, in that specific book. That's also when we see uh, other prominent feminist organizers, such as Gloria Steinem, engaging in a slightly different opposition tactic, that is uh, uh, direct lobbying. So feminists like Steinem decided to identify gatekeepers within the advertisement industry, uh, mainly female advertisers or marketers, and work with them in order to negotiate different feminist-friendly ads for feminist magazines. And that leads us straight into the second phase of appropriation, which we have labeled negotiated appropriation. So what's happening here is that uh, professional marketers and advertisers engage uh, into a gradual, progressive, but at the same time, kind of more and more systematic and holistic and coherent appropriation. And they do so by directly incorporating women's perspectives. Uh, this is due at least partially to the growing uh, uh, feminization of the industry that we witnessed at the time, uh, with advertising and marketing being actually some of the few careers at the time uh, open to women. And some of these women obviously did embrace the, the values and the message of uh, the women's rights movement. Some of them didn't. Some of them, uh, together with some male colleagues and bosses, uh, just felt it made good business sense. But that's definitely a phase uh, in which we see marketers uh, uh, commodifying not only women, but feminists themselves into a target audience. That's a phase uh, in which we see marketers uh, uh, running market research and focus groups with self-identifying feminists. And the, the outcome of that, the product of that, uh, are mainly gender neutral ads. So this is a phase in which we start seeing uh, ads promoting, selling to women products which were beforehand conventionally understood as masculine. So think bulls, think cars, think motorbikes. So once again, I picked for you guys uh, a couple of telling examples. You can see uh, they were whiskey and Smirnoff vodka. So they were whiskey here. Uh, they have chosen as promoter Shilanti uh, Long, like a prominent physicist of the time. Uh, I think the Smirnoff side is quite telling as well. Uh, what happens then uh, within feminist circles, within feminist ranks? Well, precisely because marketer strategy in this uh, second phase is more sophisticated, is more nuanced, uh, we witness a split, a strategic split uh, within the feminist camp. So liberal feminists, such as Gloria Steinem, decide to continue to critically engage uh, with the industry. They call out instances of gender washing when they see them. However, they choose to continue to try at least to collaborate with and lobby the sector. However, more radical feminists and uh, womanists, so feminists of color, as you can see, Audre Lorde behind me, uh, instead they reject advertisements and the marketing industry altogether as uh, ultimately and uh, unequivocally oppressive. And this is because they see a very deep connection between the perpetuation of patriarchy and the perpetuation of the capitalist system. And because they, they see and they condemn how sexism runs uh, alongside racism within this kind of marketing discourse. And here we go, fast forward to the 90s, 90s. <laughs> so researching this phase for me as being uh, particularly painful because these are the ads I grew up with. I was born in 1986. Uh, and I can see a few people who I think are more or less my same age and uh, who can remember uh, those kind of marketing. So a few things are happening there as well. Uh, so first of all, professional marketers uh, uh, need to deal with uh, uh, increasingly media savvy consumers. Uh, consumers uh, uh, whose attention is contended by different competitors. And so they start adopting more sensationalistic techniques. They want to shock they want to grab the viewer's attention. 
we also see interesting things happening within feminist and kind of just social justice circles in general in the sense that, hey, we are in the 90s, the Cold War is over, and kind of liberal Western values are perceived as triumphant. Uh, so is, there is definitely a kind of strand of thought that says gender equality has been achieved. We should be celebrating. And why don't we celebrate for consumption? Why don't we reclaim femininity? Why don't we reclaim any expressions of it from pink color to stilettos to lipstick or whatever? Uh, without being judgmental, I mean, the, the third wave of feminism was a very uh, complex uh, movement. Uh, but definitely what we can see within it uh, uh, is uh, a certain mainstreamization of individualistic concerns. So these all fits into what we call resignification. So this is a very extreme, a very intense form of appropriation. What's going on here is first a complete manipulation of empowerment language. So it is not only uh, absorbed and co-opted, it is resignified. It's twisted. Second, we witness a very evident, very blatant uh, resexualization and fetishization of women's body, which intriguingly is presented as the ultimate act of autonomy. I show my body, I objectify myself because this is my choice. It's a sign of empowerment. So once again, a couple of very iconic ads from the time. Probably some people here can remember this a very iconic Wonder Bra ad starring Eva Zigova. I can cook, who cares? Uh, so, oh, th this is also like a, an incredibly fascinating one, I found. This is a brilliantly successful The Beer campaign. So they're trying to sell diamond rings to women. Diamond rings were obviously traditionally bought by men for their fiancés, for their brides-to-be. Here they're saying, uh, your left hand says you're taken. Your right hand says you can take over. Buy yourself your own diamond ring and wear it on your right hand. It's very subtle, it's very clever. So I think we, we can all see what's, what's going on there. How are feminists reacting these days? Well, as I said, feminists within the third wave were a divided, fragmented bunch. And I think that also helps explain why we get the kind of resistance that we get in this space, which we label discursive resistance. So no more boycotting, not that much collaboration between uh, marketers and feminists. Uh, however, Feminists, especially feminist intellectuals, uh, name appropriation very explicitly. They do it uh, in the field of feminist media studies that is booming in those years. They do it uh, conceptualizing it through labels such as commodity feminism or neoliberal feminism. They do it differentiating themselves very explicitly from what they see as a post-feminist moment. However, more recently, say towards the end of the 2000s, something more interesting, potentially more exciting, uh, starts happening as well, an activist revival. So all those concerns, all these feelings of profound uh, dissatisfaction and frustration which, with what had been going on in the 90s and 80s, uh, fit into a new wave of feminist activism, the fourth wave. And here we are. So as I said at the beginning of this talk, the fourth wave is all about intersectionality, so uh, intersecting diversity-related concerns. Uh, it's all about uh, raising awareness about uh, the importance of women's mental health, of self-care, body positivity, and so on and so forth. And precisely because this discourse uh, is already quite sophisticated, that leads to a phase of appropriation which is incredibly nuanced, and which we call the mainstreamization of feminism. So first, uh, professional advertisers and marketers uh, appropriate the diversity theme as well. And I'm sure at least some of you in this room uh, uh, remember, for example, the recent Pantene ads, uh, or the, the, the very famous double campaign, uh, all about redefining beauty. Everyone can be beauty, body, body positivity, showcasing uh, bodies of uh, different women from uh, diverse, I think, backgrounds. Uh, Stay Street Global Advisors, uh, uh, the fearless girl, uh, you know, obviously a celebration of uh, women's role in the business community and so on. Uh, 
uh, the recruitment of uh, role models, inspiring feminist role models, once again, from uh, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. You can see here we got Misty Copeland, uh, who was in this uh, uh, the first uh, African-American uh, uh, lead ballet dancer uh, in the, I think, the New York Ballet Academy, yes, uh, recruited to, uh, to star in the Under Armour uh, YouTube commercial. So all this is going on. Even more importantly, femvertising becomes a theory, a thing in the field itself. If you Google it, uh, you're going to find that there are femvertising awards in marketing competitions that sector magazines like Adsweek uh, are all about these days discussing uh, how femvertising uh, boosts sales, how femvertising helps sell. Once again, pretty much anything. This is based, once again, on a very advanced uh, target audience segmentation. So very clearly here, uh, professionals are targeting not only women, not only women of color or self-identifying feminists, uh, but conscious consumers among millennials. Finally, uh, and I mean, this is a Pandora box. We, we could be talking about this for hours, but obviously we don't have the time, uh, but there is a very interesting intersection between the appropriation work performed in this phase and so-called prosumption trends. Has anyone heard the word prosumption? No? So prosumption being a hybrid between uh, production and consumption. And it's connected to the idea that all of us, as internet users, uh, consume and produce big data, which are then uh, used and sold by companies to other companies to target us uh, with very specific uh, targeted online advertisement. Now, what's interesting is that uh, it is Fort Waver's very digital activism, it is our own very digital activism that allows these companies to target us with very specific ads using the themes that are close to our heart. And I think that's even a more uh, upsetting trend that we can point to here, the exploitation of micro-influencers. So, uh, as I said, fourth waivers are all about uh, asking for more diversity and uh, criticizing unattainable beauty standards. So this has translated into many companies' choices to replace professional models and star in their ads or use to sell their products uh, real-life women we tend to be very young, and in many cases, especially in the cases of micro-influencers, to be underpaid and underprotected. Finally, very quickly, how am I doing with time, Michelle? Okay, just a couple of extra minutes. Uh, what's going on the feminist side? Well, I mean, this is obviously an ongoing phase, but, but we're fairly confident we could call this a phase of diffused feminist engagement. So once again, Feminists are split. Some of them prefer working on ensuring that uh, the industry is uh, or becomes accountable to them. Uh, so they try to call out for instances of blatant gender washing. Once again, State Street Global Advisors is a good example, and so was Audi. So both these companies uh, produced this kind of advertising like commercials, but then uh, they came under the fire uh, because it was found that there were different lawsuits. Uh, going on uh, against them for issues related to sex-based discrimination at work, uh, gender pay gap, uh, and so on. However, some other feminists feel that it is instead uh, a priority to defend uh, the purity, uh, the radicality of the feminist message. So we feel that what all of them are doing is essentially continuously uh, engaging in a discursive renegotiation of this space. So I'm going to hang here with this last slide where I pointed out uh, our main contributions to the existing theory, but I thought what could be uh, most interesting for you guys is instead probably to point out the ways in which we feel we're also contributing to broader social innovation and social justice discourses uh, in the sense that what this historical trajectory, this historical evolution that we trace back really tells us is that we're witnessing a power struggle. And within these power struggles, forces are unbalanced. 
we are looking at firms which can obviously count on uh, uh, material and discursive resources that are unavailable uh, to feminist activists. However, and we feel very strongly about this, we feel that our research also points to the possibility, to the potential for meaningful resistance. And that actually by listening, by analyzing the work, the practices, the actions that social justice activists have been putting into place, uh, we can help illuminating uh, some patterns towards resistance. Ultimately, because we believe that every kind of research, including research in the institutional field, uh, should uh, critically engage uh, with what's going on in the world and being built towards meaningful social change. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lilia. Um, so we have around 10 minutes for questions, and a few of us were practicing our throwing at lunchtime, oh and it yes. occurred to us that we have three professional rugby players. Oh, yeah. In this room. <laughs> so um, uh, James has the chucky mic currently. Of course, Charlie. <laughs> Not a professional rugby player. But, uh, would you care to start us off with a comment or chuck us the mic? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, sure, I'd love to. Anyone? Please, Jim. Intersectionality. Mm -hmm. This phenomenon is inevitable. It's not done. <laughs> Ben says it is, but... <laughs> yeah, all right. Sorry, Bill. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, intersectionality mm -hmm. is an example. Mm -hmm. Isn't it almost inevitable that in any political kind of movement, you are going to have, you know, kind of the fallouts that you have had all the way through feminism, which therefore makes it more vulnerable to appropriation? So the example being that Anglo-American white women speaking on behalf of disabled black women Absolutely. is surely, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, going to cause a, a rift and a division. And where there is that, there will be an appropriation opportunity mm. for um, people to come in and uh, exploit that. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you deal with that? So if I understand you correctly, <laughs> you're asking me about... <laughs> So if I understand you correctly, you're asking me about uh, instances of appropriation work that happen within the movement itself. Yeah. Is that right? I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, in that, I mean, many historians of feminism would say that uh, the lack of intersectionality, that this kind of appropriation work uh, going on within the movement uh, uh, has been one of the reasons uh, of the I don't want to say the failure, but definitely of the end and decline of feminist activism in, uh, during several of the waves. Uh, during the first wave, for sure, during the second wave, most evidently. Uh, so definitely feminists of colors have been feeling their issues, their voices uh, were being appropriated by white women, by white middle class women, heterosexual women, and so on and so forth. My answer to that would be that I feel the fourth way, and I might not be completely ob objective in, uh, in my answer, but my feeling is that the fourth way is trying to deal with this at least more explicitly and openly and consciously that other ways have done it. It doesn't mean it's perfect. However, um, as someone who deeply cares about social movements, social justice movements of any kind, and has studied them, I feel that there is a risk if we just start focusing on the problems that are internal to these movements and we lose sight of what's the real enemy and what's going on outside. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about all this. Just uh, the enemy, as far as I'm concerned, is not within. Anyone else? Oh my God, you're far away. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna see whether I can do that. Oh, sorry, almost. Where is it? Just behind you. 
So um, the, my, my question is um, around the kind of motivation, yes. um, particularly in the advertising piece. Mm -hmm. So um, how, how, do you, how do you kind of um, look at and feel about the motivation for advertisers, whether it's I just want to make as much money as I can selling Wonder Bras, or is there also kind of an inherent and inherent you know, during that period, and, and I, I guess now, um, aim of you know some institutions and men to you know keep um, you know women in the kitchen or wherever it is that you know the, the that kind of those issues that are floated around. Mm. I'm so glad you asked this question uh, because it's a very important one. I think motivations are complex and they differ a lot. And thankfully, because of the data we managed to gather, we were also able to tap into this a little bit. Uh, so I can definitely. Uh, you know, bring up examples of uh, marketers and advertisers, especially female ones, who genuinely cared. Uh, they were sympathetic uh, with the, the women's movement goals that was happening, especially in the 60s. Uh, and they felt that working with people like Gloria Steinem was definitely a way for them to make a meaningful contribution. So this was happening, and I think this is still happening. Uh, I, so part of our data also come from like online conversations with uh, women who identify as feminine and, and men actually people of all genders who identify as feminists uh, who care about social justice work in marketing and they see these as a way to help however i think this is just a part of what's going on like if you look at the macro level ultimately what's happening here is companies are uh, uh, trying to sell their products and uh, this is why I mentioned a couple of cases in which uh, there was a clear gap uh, you know, between uh, what the, the companies were doing, like at the, the PR level, with all their lovely like, feminist intersectional campaigns, uh, and then their levels of gender pay gap, uh, instances of sexism or even sexual harassment uh, within those very companies and so on. Uh, so it's complicated, but my answer to, to that will be that this is why we need to simultaneously look at both levels. At the micro levels, I think it's very important to discuss motivations and highlight uh, positive, meaningfully and genuinely positive ones, but this uh, doesn't undermine a macro level structural critique, I feel. Now you get to throw the mic, I think. Lucky you. Oh, God. I'm bad. Um, I'll, I'll try to verbalize this, but what advertising does, right, on the one hand, it's selling also to women your perfect 200-pound Lululemon yoga outfit, and then to be a feminist, this is what you have to look like. Yes. But then on the flip side, there's just as much, probably if not more, posts about, I got engaged, I'm having a baby, and my question is, is the advertising often pushing maybe values or ideals that we aspire to have, but as a society on a large, those values are still not within us? Because I think there is a stigma if the woman is the one who earns more in a relationship, is more successful, doesn't want kids, doesn't want all those things. I, th I don't know, I find it, those two things kind of often crash in advertising and then often what happens in real life, it's like, I am a feminist, but would I be more comfortable earning, you know, five times more than my husband? Mm -hmm. All those things, so yeah. No, I think you're spot on, and you perfectly identified the, the tension that is at the core uh, of the study. And so if you were asking me, do you prefer feminist ads or sexist ads? Well, of course I prefer the former, <laughs> because sexist ads are deeply offensive. Uh, so I'm delighted, as I said, that the feminist message uh, is becoming embedded in society to the point that the private sector feels that they need to reiterate the message to sell. However, I do still think it's important to ask ourselves this question because there is a, a huge risk uh, that, as I said before, the radical core of the message ends up being trivialized and neutralized. Uh, and I think you're spot on when you say that selling the feminist rhetoric and aesthetics uh, means telling women that in order to be feminist, they need to consume and purchase, and that I find highly problematic. Thanks, Lena, that's really interesting. Um, so I, I think one of the defining kind of elements of this phase of feminism, which feels different, although I might be wrong from previous ones, is that actually we 
you know, to, to change that power dynamic, there's been a push to kind of get everyone to say I'm a feminist, mm. the whole T-shirt, I'm a feminist mm. thing. Um, Christian Dior, by the way. Our husbands also can say they're feminists, that kind of thing. And um, so whilst it's not the same as kind of private or advertising and appropriation, in a way we're kind of asking for feminism to be appropriated by everyone. And so what impact does that have on the message and the ability for the kind of feminist message about changing power dynamics if we're asking everyone to be a feminist? But when do you say we, whom do we, you mean? Sorry, yeah, um, the feminist movement. You know, we I, mean, I don't know movement. what we, I don't, you know, we can mean, I don't know, but in that kind of conscious effort to encourage a broadening of the base of people who say I'm a feminist, mm. what does that do to what it's trying to achieve? Mm. I'm not sure I understand completely. If, if I understand your saying, and if so, I agree with you, that in this phase, the movement is uh, consciously going broader. So once upon a time, the movement was quite happy to be a niche movement or to be a counterculture or whatever. I mean, it's a huge simplification, but obviously there were phases in which this was happening. While you're saying right now, feminists are actually happy to be in the mainstream. They want to be in the mainstream. They want every girl, every woman around the world to say, I'm a feminist. And so you're asking me whether I think that this contributes to the appropriation. Is but that? It's, all, every, it's asking every man. Every oh, asking every man. OK, yeah, feminist. sorry. I didn't understand you. Um, gosh, that's a tough one. I'm, well, as you know, I, I'm very passionate about including men in the movement towards gender equality, something I, I feel strongly about. So I'm delighted every time uh, a man calls himself a feminist. And I know there's several kind of self-identifying male feminists in this room. Uh, however, I, I, I see what you're saying. I think the only answer to that is that what's going on right now, discursively speaking, is very complex. It's very subtle on both sides. So the feminist discourse had become sophisticated, and so has uh, the, 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 the appropriation work performed by the private sector. And uh, I don't think there's a universal answer. I, I, I see that risk that you're pointing to. I don't think the answer is uh, uh, to, to kind of lock ourselves down in our kind of intellectual feminist circles and just talk to each other and saying, no, no one else is a feminist. But I do see that tension, uh, and that's why I'm interested in studying this, essentially. Sorry, it's not a real answer, but it's a work in progress. My pleasure.